Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim and assalamu alaikum. Uh, welcome to another episode of my weekly program, Double Standard, which I present to you every Monday, 6 to 7 p.m. UK time. This is a live as well as it is interactive program. Having said that, interactive is that we present the program for the first half an hour and after that we take a break and when we come back from the break, the telephone lines are opened. All the viewers are welcome to uh, make telephone calls either to ask a question pertaining to the program topic or if they want to add something as a flavor to the program and their own knowledge. Uh, this program, the topic for today's program is, uh, is House of Saud in total chaos? And today we have the pleasure of the company of Brother Shabir Razavi. Brother Shabir Razavi uh, is an accomplished uh, finance expert. Uh, he is uh, a human rights activist. He is an analyst and he has done, done hundreds of programs. At least with me, uh, with him and, and me, we have done about 50, 60 programs in the last two, last two three years. And uh, those programs, I mean, they mostly they were on the social, political and and the foreign policy issues of different countries. So for, I welcome Brother Shabir Razvi to the program. Welcome, Brother Shabir. Assalamu alaikum. It's a pleasure, as usual. So we start the program as, uh, you know, the topic is, is House of Saud in total chaos? Now, Saudi Arabia's autocratic regime, which we call the Saud regime, which is uh, under the Suderi uh, king, King Salman, and uh, this is, uh, we would like to discuss four or five different angles of their nemesis or as the French call uh, bête noire of the Saudi regime. Uh, we will discuss th the social issues, the political issues, their national economy, uh, their military issues and overall scenario that how that country is being led by a crew of maniacs which are running that country like a ship without rudders or compass and they are driving it so fast towards the icebergs to sink it down to the bottom maybe in five to seven years time and uh, we will discuss that in details today in today's program so brother Shabir when we talk about the social problems uh, we if we list them there could be eight to ten big problems but uh, I would like you to uh, to uh, uh, shed some light on, uh, on, 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 the, on the youth, the resentment of youth, how the youth they are living the life in Saudi Arabia. I mean, their uh, employment aspect, their uh, you know, education, uh, their, their social regeneration, if at all there is some. So what would you say about the youth? Well, look, um, brother, what is fascinating about Saudi um, sort of regime or the manner in which the ruling family operates there is the population, as you well know, is about 30 million, of which the under 30 population, if you like, is significantly high, 65 to 70 percent, is virtually youth population, which in other countries would be uh, seen as a, um, uh, a benefit to the nation because mm -hmm. the the reason why we in Europe are suffering economic crisis is that we've got an aging population. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the government has to find the money, the resources to look after people like myself who are over 60 years old, who become old, uh, become a pressure on the National Health Service and so on. Whilst in a country like Saudi Arabia or other developing countries, the younger population actually should be contributing to the economy mm -hmm. because they've got another 30, 40 years of working life before they become retirees mm -hmm. and, and become a burden on the nation. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. that's not happening mm -hmm. in Saudi. The reason is manifold, as you've quite rightly sort of described, the issue, you know, the, the fundamental issue is lack of freedom in Saudi because the younger people, uh, particularly, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of famous phrase that uh, uh, Churchill mm -hmm. used when he was talking to Anthony Eden, who was his, his uh, son-in-law, as you know, and at Cambridge, uh, sorry, at Oxford, when Anthony Eden was an undergraduate, came to Churchill very excitedly saying that, you know, I could get you hundreds of youth to join the Conservative Party. And Churchill replied, go away. And he said, why? 
He said, look, you know, when they're 25 and it's still conservative, bring them to me. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> so as you become older, you become more conservative yeah, in approach. Yeah, yeah. So the younger people require more freedom. Uh, freedom, I don't mean immoral freedom, but at least a freedom of thought, freedom of expression, freedom to um, explore themselves properly. In a country where women are not allowed to drive a car, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, uh, no one talks about it in, in, in sort of any significant way. Now and then you might get an article here and there saying that, you know, women are protest protesting. But the reality is that youth have that pressure mm -hmm. that they, they can't sort of operate whether they're female who can't drive or males who do not have, um, you know, way of expressing themselves. Secondly, uh, the education, yeah, I mean, you know, one says that there are universities, Medina University and other universities in, 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 in Saudi, which are churning out graduates. But do they have the passion for learning, these youth? Because quite often employment is created, if it is created, because on the employment level, there's about 30 percent youth unemployment. Perhaps some economists say actually it's much higher that the younger people do not get an opportunity of jobs because perhaps the lack of education or the education that is being given is not uh, fitting with the, with the requirements of the economy. And on the other hand, you look at it, that you have a 30 million population and still there are about 10 million expats working in, in, in Saudi Arabia. Therefore, the expats are still contributing in many ways and running a lot of the businesses, whether it's the banking sector or in the oil industry um, and, and other areas of the economy. So you've got youth unemployment, you've got lack of freedom, you've got women uh, who are really suppressed in such a manner that they can't even drive cars. And as you know, that they can't travel without a, a chaperone, uh, mm -hmm. a male chaperone, if you like. And they talk about, you know, I was sort of watching a, a, a clip of one, um, uh, you know, uh, mediocre mufti in, in, in Saudi saying that, oh, we don't allow women to go out because for their own protection. It's not for their own protection. It's because you want to suppress them. Well, anyway, <laughs> I mean, all these factors, suppression, mm. uh, if you call it as main, one of the main uh, reasons, then stress and insecurity amongst the youth, that escalates lawlessness, delinquency, juvenile crimes. And having said that, the criminal justice system in, in, in Saudi Arabia that's completely shambolic. So the, 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 the smaller crimes the youth used to commit about 10 years, 15 years ago, they would get about, sometimes they would get away with it, milder punishment, sometimes six months, sentence, sometimes, sometimes incarcerated for a month and then say, all right, don't do it next time. But now the punishments, they have been uh, five-folded. Now for a small crimes, Small crimes, they, 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 they are sentencing people, youth, like five, five years. So are they conveying a sort of message that the judicial system will be directed towards all youth who will not be in conformity with the state system? Well, of course, look, at the end of the day, a regime which, as you, um, you know, in your opening comments says that is better noir, is probably, you know, if there's a stronger word than better noir, it's an ugly regime. Mm -hmm. It's not only black, and mm -hmm. but it's ugly, it's horrible, it really has no understanding what justice is all about. So the reality uh, that transpires out of this is that, uh, um, you know, uh, narcotics, drug use, alcoholism, these are also phenomena which mm -hmm. are quite significant. Mm -hmm. uh, although one says that, uh, you know, alcohol is banned in Saudi, but uh, there are ways that one can get alcohol. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's not just... You only, can get from Bahrain? Absolutely. You know, just <laughs> go over the bridge. And I mean, uh, 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 I was with a, a client uh, of mine years ago uh, in Bahrain, uh, 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 he, a Lebanese Christian. And after a meeting, he said, Shabir, we'll go out uh, for a meal and, you know, tell me what type of alcohol you like. I said, I don't drink. He said, you don't drink? You live in London? I said, I've never had the need. He said, come with me on a uh, Thursday night. I'll show your brothers paralytically drunk on the road. <laughs> and these are all, you know, Saudis coming over the so bridge. So maybe, maybe this term <laughs> binge drinker that comes from that, that part possibly, of the world. Possibly. So, I mean, I mean uh, let's talk about something. Uh, the family structure, the family life. Obviously, they are the Arabs. And... Uh, 
our Prophet Muhammad, Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he lived there, and he established the best family system, where there was respect for the mother, respect for wife, respect for daughter, daughter-in-law, son-in-law, and the family unit was the strongest, uh, you know, relationship amongst the amongst the people. So we don't find that at all. We don't find that in Saudi Arabia. So uh, I mean, I recently uh, wrote, uh, read some report that more than 30% marriages, they end up in divorce within the first two years. What would you say about the family? Well, it's actually more than that. I mean, the, the, the problem is not particularly uh, uh, sort of prevalent in Saudi. In the whole of the Khalij, if you look at from Kuwait uh, to the uh, Bahrain mm -hmm. and Saudi Arabia, it's one in two marriages that actually break down. And there are a number of reasons if you look behind. First is obviously the wealth that has come into the hands of not just the royal family but also many of the other people. Although on the other hand we've got unemployment and so on but those people who do have money the expectations become very high uh, of, of, of the uh, female if you like that she may want you know uh, um, uh, branded goods therefore the affordability uh, is, is not there at times borrowing goes higher and, and it's financially related because at the end of the day, a, a happy marriage requires, whether it's in Saudi Arabia or any part of the world, is to have an understanding between the spouses mm -hmm. and, and uh, between the uh, husband and wife so that if there are economic issues that are challenging the marriage, then they work out a solution for it. Mm -hmm. However, in the oil producing nations of the Gulf, where money has really gushed out of the ground, uh, that sort of uh, moderation has also disappeared. So wealth has contributed to divorces in one way. Mm -hmm. Secondly, of course, uh, you know, uh, uh, the pressure on the woman, as we were talking about earlier, of lack of freedom, not being able to drive a car, having to go outside uh, the house with a chaperone, these also must have an impact within the marriage situation as well. Thirdly, if you like, mm -hmm. the male uh, thinking that, you know, I have the money, therefore he may be having illicit relationships outside the marriage, mm -hmm. which also could easily contribute to the breakdown of the marriage. So there are multiple aspects why. But coming back to the family unit, mm -hmm. if you like. Look, uh, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam obviously walked on that, uh, you know, holy land in Mecca and Medina and other parts of the world. Now it is under the occupation of a ghastly regime. Uh, but the reality of the situation is that uh, even at the time of the Prophet or soon after the death of the Prophet, we had tribalism which came mm -hmm. into the Islamic empire. Mm -hmm. You know, either you were Hashimis or Umayyads or, you know, Ansar and, you know, all these kinds mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. labels. So that tribalism which has been part of the uh, culture of, of the peninsula of Arabia uh, um, showed its ugly head soon after the death of the Prophet, which continues till, till this day, that a, a family which is, you know, uh, Al Saud, uh, you know, for, from, 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 from uh, that part of the world, who are a tribal leaders, if you like. And, okay, and we'll carry on with that discussion, and uh, we would like to take a short break, uh, which uh, that break is for uh, the Azan to, to, to Maghreban, and uh, we will come back after the Azan. So we take a short break.